The Holy Island Tour The Holy Isle lies off the southwest coast of Scotland. Just two miles long, but with a majestic presence, the island has been associated with Celtic Christianity for almost 1,500 years. It's now a registered UK sacred site with free public access. In 1992, Churje Lame Yeshe Lurzal Rinpoche, abbot of Kagyu Sami Ling Monastery in Dumfrieshire and chairman of the Rokpa Trust, took over custodianship. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision was for the Holy Isle to become a living, spiritual centre open to people of all faiths and none, dedicated to fostering pure minds within a pure environment. With this aim, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche founded the Centre for World Peace and Health, an international interfaith centre for peace, retreat and reconciliation with all development work undertaken in harmony with nature to conserve the island. All the buildings were in a semi-derelict state, having suffered damage from the wind, rain, dry rot and vandalism, but by the summer of 2000, the farmhouse renovations were complete and the first guests were invited to stay. The second phase of the development at the north was the construction of two wings off the main farmhouse to provide additional guest accommodation and a large dining area. They formed a courtyard which offered protection from the wind. This was combined with the construction of the Peace Hall to host courses, workshops and conferences. This enclosed the fourth side of the courtyard and together these formed the Centre for World Peace and Health. Beautiful gardens surround the Centre for World Peace and Health, providing year-round organic vegetables, fruit, herbs and flowers for use in the Centre's kitchen and public spaces. The island caters for 8 to 80 people a week and the kitchen staff are involved in planning what the gardeners will grow the following year. The gardens are at the heart of Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision of environmental sustainability and his belief that our own health and well-being is not separate from the health and well-being of the natural world. Next on the Holy Island Tour, a stupa or churten in Tibetan is a 2,500 year old tradition introduced and taught by the Buddha to help transform and purify imbalance in the environment. The measurements of the outer form have to be extremely precise and the inner contents properly placed and consecrated. There are eight different kinds of stupa in Tibetan Buddhism, each referring to a major event in the Buddha's life. In keeping with the local style and culture, there were no intentions of building stupas or hanging prayer flags, items which are popular within the Tibetan culture. Over time, more people expressed an interest in these, so plans were drawn up to build stupas within the front wall of the centre. The design was later changed, and the stupas were moulded and built in 2002 at their present location, just in front of the pontoon where visitors are greeted. As a joint project between Holy Isle and Ayrshire Council, including a visit from the local MP, a fundraising effort brought donations in excess of £300,000 to install a custom-made 74-metre floating pontoon as a modern alternative to the ageing jetty. Components, materials, rocks and an excavator were ferried over to help construct the pontoon, whereas concrete for the foundations was mixed on Aran and flown across by helicopter. The old jetty was covered with hundreds of tonnes of rocks to improve the aesthetics and act as a breakwater. The project was completed in April 2013 and took about a week. Rinpoche led a dedication ceremony which was attended by volunteers and visitors. In April 2016, the cattle chute was converted into a wooden platform for yoga and meditation. As we continue towards the northern tip of the island, we reach Red Rock, a large red sandstone outcrop with small rock pools and views towards the north of Arran. Soon after Red Rock, the path ends and gives way to rocks, boulders and overgrown vegetation, which marks the start of the nature reserve on the east of the island. Visitors are politely requested not to walk there for their own safety, 
and so the animals remain undisturbed. The east coast of the island is more exposed to the wind and weather. There are several features including a small pebble beach, the two burns, two gullies of water running off the plateau. In 1971, the University's Federation for Animal Welfare owned the island and introduced five Eriske ponies, descendants of the Kelto-Nordic native ponies from the Hebridean Isle of Eriske. The ponies are a hardy breed with a dense waterproof coat, enabling them to live comfortably in the Scottish climate all year round. They are often born black or bay and turn grey and later white as they grow older. The ponies spend their time on the plateaus of the hills or on the fields at the south end, but they regularly graze the fields surrounding the centre at the north. The UFAW introduced 25 soy sheep. This ancient breed have been present on the outer Hebridean island of soy, Norse for sheep, since the Bronze Age. They are smaller and more elegant than domesticated sheep, dark brown in colour with a whitish belly. They travel in groups and their coats gradually drop off over time. In terms of marine life, there are many colourful and interesting jellyfish in the Bay of Lamlash. Common and grey seals are often seen near Holy Island Jetty or basking on red rock. And there have been occasional sightings of porpoises, bottlenose dolphins, basking sharks and minky whales. There are over 20 species of birds breeding on the island and closer to 60 species have been sighted on the island. The white San and goats, with impressive horns and smiling faces, were rumoured to have been brought to the island by the Vikings as livestock, although it's more likely the Victorian gamekeepers introduced them. They tend to be quite solitary and will eat most things, including seaweed. The lighthouse keepers sometimes kept goats to give milk to their children. In Lama Rinpoche's words, the wild indigenous animals are all given a home and not asked to do anything except enjoy their lives. As we continue, the outer lighthouse is located at Pillar Rock Point, the southeastern point of the island. It is a larger lighthouse and was built in 1905 by David and Charles Stevenson. Its tower height is 23 metres and it had a foghorn. The revolving light was lit by paraffin and it required three keepers. It has several rooms inside for the men who worked there and it was the first lighthouse built with a square tower. Near the southerly tip of the island, just before we rejoin the south end buildings and inner lighthouse, is Lama Yeshe's seat, a natural meditation box carved into the sandstone by the action of ancient seas. This is one of the many powerful places on Holy Island which Rinpoche has used since the Holy Island project began. Rinpoche's intention from the outset was for Holy Isle to be a place of retreat. In Tibet, traditional meditation retreats were undertaken in mountain caves, and this inspired Rinpoche's vision for modern cave-like retreat pods. Given the more isolated and hard-to-reach location of the south end of the island, Rinpoche felt this would be the best location for the pods, and he intended to build 108 due to the auspiciousness of this number in both Buddhism and the Tibetan culture. Despite having permission to build the 108 pods, Rinpoche decided that it would be overcrowded and not beneficial for the island, so he reduced the number to just two, located on the hillside below Wisdom Palace. The inner lighthouse is located on the southwest coast, facing Arran at the south entrance of Lamlash Bay. It was built in 1877 by the well-known lighthouse engineers David and Thomas Stevenson. Its tower height is 17 metres. It had a green light and required four keepers. It is known locally as Wee Donald. The Stevensons also designed four cottages with a walled garden for crops, which were built adjacent to the inner lighthouse to house four families. The gardens are well on their way to producing enough fresh food for up to 25 people based 
at the private retreat at the south. As we leave the south end and start to walk clockwise towards the north, as is customary in Tibetan culture, we see images of some of the great lineage holders carved into the rocks. Namely, Marpa, Milarepa, Gampopa, and the first Karmapa, Dusum Kiempa. These great beings have special significance for all Tibetan Buddhists, particularly those of the Karma Kagyu school. There are also carvings of deities such as Green Tara, White Tara, and the Buddha himself. Lama Yeshe decided which lamas or deities should be carved and chose the rocks. Most were granite, but some were a more porous sandstone. All the images, except for the large Buddha, were drawn by master artist Sherab Paldenbaru on paper, then transferred to the rocks by one of his students. Before reaching St Malasha's cave, we come across two neighbouring landmarks. The first is a fresh spring known as the Healing Well. Pure fresh water bubbles up from below the mountain in a seemingly endless stream. Pilgrims continued to visit the well into the 20th century seeking a cure for ills and to bring a blessing. The next landmark is a huge block of stone with a level top known as the Judgment Stone or St Malash's Table. The four top corners have been cut out in what could be seats and it has been suggested that the stone was used to preach from or to proclaim justice. St Malash's judgment for those who sought him out to settle grievances. The Judgment Stone also has an unusual cross carved into it, one of only three of its kind found in Britain. The cave where St Malasha lived for a decade in the late 6th century is about halfway along the western shore of Holy Island and about 10 metres above high water mark. It consists of an overhanging sandstone rock with a sunken stone floor and it's thought that much of the opening of the cave was closed up by a wall to keep the weather out. A Celtic cross adorns the sandstone above the cave entrance and simple crosses are carved into the walls, perhaps made by pilgrims. St Malasha had an ample supply of fresh water, but the island was rather scant of other resources for growing food. Given its historical significance, Rinpoche left the cave in its original state. Layers of animal dung were removed, but he did not dig down enough to fully expose the original floor slabs so the original cave floor was significantly deeper. Stones were laid into the hillside as steps for easier visitor access, and slabs were put down to protect the original floor. There is also a visitor's bench nearby. As we continue to walk along the path towards the north, we reach White Point, a protruding cliff sitting six metres above the shoreline. Holy Isle, Lamlash and Lamlash Bay played a significant role in both world wars, Lamlash being a busy naval base and a popular anchorage for the Navy between the wars. Throughout World War II, the base was protected by booms supporting huge anti-submarine nets at both ends of the bay. Next to the boathouse, there is a huge iron ring set into the ground that was a tethering point for one of those nets. At White Point, there are the remains of a defensive brick-built gun position. In stark contrast to its wartime use, Rinpoche intends to build a massive crystal stupa at White Point, so he renamed it Stupa Point. From the beginning of the Holy Island project, there has been an opportunity to sponsor trees on the island. Many of these are dedicated to loved ones, including Akon Rinpoche and the children of Dunblane. Since 1993, over 45,000 trees have been planted on the island by volunteers, guided by a professional forester. The next landmark we reach is the boathouse. By the late 1990s, the boathouse was completely shambolic, having been used to store bits of metal and rubbish over many years, probably to avoid the cost of removing them from the island. The remaining sections of roof were blown off in a storm, in late 1998. With Rinpoche's determination to serve the public, the boathouse was renovated during the long hot summer of 2000. 
and a new roof was added two years later. It is now used as an information centre and to offer a complimentary cup of tea or coffee and shelter to those who are waiting for the ferry. Now that we've completed a full lap of the island, all that remains is a trek over the island's summit. The summit is accessed through a gap in the stone wall just to the north of the farmhouse. It leads up a grassy hill to a stile which continues along a winding path through woodland. This gets progressively steeper until reaching the first peak on Mullach Beg at 231 metres. The terrain then levels off before becoming more rocky with a final rough scramble up the windswept summit of Mullach Moor at an altitude of 314 metres. The summit offers wonderful panoramic views of the Ayrshire coast, Arran and the Clyde estuary. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's motivation for Holy Isle was to bring great benefit and inspiration to people everywhere through the combination of pure minds within a pure environment. Thanks to his inspiring vision and tireless energy, the Holy Isle project has built up a worldwide reputation and united hearts and minds through shared goals and interfaith dialogue. This vision of how the world could be a place of safety, peace and harmony for all sentient beings has been echoed by His Holiness 17th Gyalwa Karmapa. We are most fortunate to have made a connection with this holy place and to all the precious and generous people who have contributed to this unique altruistic project. A team of dedicated volunteers have made it possible to actualize Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision for Holy Island, both in terms of the development and the ongoing running and maintenance of the island, thus making Holy Isle a beautiful and sustainable place to visit and to live. <laughs>